1705FNA, allowing the purchase and use of marijuana by a dove, regulating the purchase and use of marijuana, imposing taxes on the wholesale and retail sale of marijuana. Thank you, Madam Chair, and esteemed members of the committee. Uh, for the uh, veterans who are still here, uh, you may recognize this bill as uh, the one that uh, was retained two years ago. That was 1652 FNA. Uh, 1705 FNA is almost identical to it. Uh, I'm going to cover a little bit of the intervening two years, what's been happening in other states and the initiatives that the states are taking to make some corrections because primarily we're not seeing much out of the federal government, although at the present time, uh, Barney Frank and uh, Ron Paul have a bill in front of Congress which will return the, uh, will take the, the federal government out of this issue and put it back into the 50 states where we can all uh, experiment as Justice Brandeis had once said, in, you know, the 50 states of uh, democracy. Uh, so we can find out what's working. We do know that prohibition is a failed policy, it continues to be a failed policy, and yet it persists year after year after year without change. And that's why it is incumbent upon the states to make some, take some initiative in this matter. Uh, in 2010, three states, New Hampshire, California, and Washington State, all took initiatives in this direction. This year, it's two states, Colorado and New Hampshire. Uh, and it looks like uh, the good people of Colorado will have a chance to vote on their initiative. Uh, we want to push this forward primarily because the debate is starting to appear at the federal level where it needs to appear. The findings of this committee when, it was, when uh, the previous bill was retained two years ago, the primary stumbling block is what are we going to do about the feds? How can we deal with the feds? We're, I'm going to try to address that by simply going to the particulars of the bill and allowing uh, all the other speakers uh, to address other issues. Um, if you have the bill in front of you, I'm going to go right to the, the first numbered page. <coughs> The findings of the general court are all outlined there. Uh, there's one of them, the fifth one, that I'm going to come back to in my presentation later. Uh, if certain portions of this act are found to be inoperable and unconstitutional, it is the intent of the people of the state of New Hampshire to implement as much of this act as possible. So we have made the, uh, the act visible. Uh, if some parts don't work, other parts can be implemented. Our intent is to implement those parts that can be. And that, of course, is part of the federal response to this, the federal prohibition. Section 1, which starts on line 20 of that page, are simply the definitions of marijuana, marijuana paraphernalia, retailer, state prosecution, wholesaler, uh, as, as it pertains to this act. When you get down to page 2, line 9, authorized activities are listed there. And of course, any activity not in that section is still prohibited by law. The principal ones are uh, the age restriction, anyone under the age of 21 cannot legally use marijuana, possess marijuana paraphernalia, and all of the prohibitions that are currently in place for all people will still remain in place for those 21 or under. It also addresses the wholesaler and retailer's uh, abilities, what sort of licenses they will have and what they can do with those licenses. When you go down to line 26, uh, it begins to define exactly what a retailer is, uh, the owner, employee, or agent of the retailer, and what sort of uh, privileges they have under this bill. Uh, and those are simply listed in uh, alphabetical order here. Anything not listed there remains prohibited. I can't stress that enough. This does not completely, across the board, legalize marijuana. There are still many prohibitions in place. The primary prohibition that we're attempting to live now is for those who adults who are 21 years or older who are still plugging a part of our judicial and correctional system. <coughs> On page three, line six, this is the section that deals with the whole thing. In many parts of this bill, you will see repetition with only the word retailer removed and the word wholesaler put into place both have much the same restrictions and privileges under this act. And finally, when you get to the end of that page, it, it indicates what sort of uh, defenses are permissible uh, under this act for people who, who would otherwise be charged with a crime under the, the present prohibition. 
Moving on to page four. This is some, uh, still continues to define what is permissible, whereas when you get down to line uh, eight, it clearly defines what remains illegal. So there's no confusions about what you can and cannot do under this act. When you get down to line 25, there's a single line there uh, pertaining to uh, the rights of employers. And uh, to sum it up, basically, uh, an employer does not have to accommodate the use, possession, or being under the influence of marijuana for many of his employees in, in the place of employment. So the employer has full, full rights to, to restrict his employees under this bill. The next section, line 27, indicates the penalties for minors. It's defined as a misdemeanor, but later on in the bill, you'll see that it's a misdemeanor <coughs> B. Uh, and, and the penalties there are, are, are limited. So this, this single line that simply said they're going to be guilty of a misdemeanor is being clarified further on in the bill. Uh, limitations on penalties are the next section, 318B, 26B. That's line 32. And then we get into the uh, what I think is one of the more important aspects of this legislation, which is the taxation. How are we going to manage it if we're going to allow people 21 or older to uh, use marijuana? With your indulgence, may I have a sip of lunch? Because I'm already drying out. I've taken any history today. Thank you. If you spill it, though, you have to clean it up. <laughs> I have to clean it up. <laughs> um, at the end of page four, uh, is the beginning of the chapter, the taxation of marijuana. And I'll cover the particulars very quickly here. Uh, the department that's going to be overseeing uh, the revenue is the Department of Revenue Administration. Uh, when you go down to line 10, you get to part 77G2, in which it addresses uh, retailer licenses. Uh, further down on line 18, it sets the fee at $1,000 for the retailer's license. And it indicates in lines 20 to 22 that if the Department of Revenue fails to act in timely fashion, which is defined as 90 days under this act, anybody that holds a valid retail tobacco license uh, would then deem to be able to, to be a retailer under this license. When you get down to line 28, the wholesaler's license is it. And as I discussed earlier, we're simply substituting much of the same language for retailer and we're taking out the word retailer and putting in the word wholesaler. The wholesale license is also $1,000. Uh, again, if the wholesaler has a valid uh, retail tobacco wholesale license and the department fails to act within the 90 day period of approval, they, they would also gain it. Uh, the qualified applicants are defined in the next section. It goes on in uh, page six, line 10 through 16 to define the prohibition on licenses. When you go a little bit further down the bill, it, it, it defines what a retailer shall not be allowed to do under this act. Moving on to the next page, page seven, uh, it indicates what, what sort of defenses are admissible in the case of someone who does sell someone who's 21 years or younger. These are admissible defenses under the law. Uh, and they're detailed going down to line 12. Activities that are prohibited by a wholesaler, again, we have the repetition of like, much of what the retailer can't do, the wholesaler can't do. Uh, and that, that covers the bulk of page seven. Moving on to page eight, uh, we have the rate of taxation starting at line seven. Uh, the excise tax will be leveled on wholesalers at the rate of $45 per ounce, or proportionate thereof. The, the uh, retailers themselves will be taxed at the rate of 19% of the wholesale price for the product that they'll be selling. The next section, 77G8, defines the distribution of taxes under the Act. The first is to cover the entire cost of the administration of this chapter. Then the money that's remaining will go to the state treasurer, and the general fund will receive 50%, the Health and Human Services will receive 50%, for their operating budget for programs concerning the prevention and treatment of the abuse of alcohol and tobacco, marijuana, other controlled substances. Section 77G9 prohibits advertising. Section 77G10 
concerns the transportation and a prohibition against bringing marijuana into the state from outside and the reverse, taking marijuana from the state out of the state, which still remains prohibited. <laughs> and section 77G11, starting on line 26, is the administration rulemaking, uh, the uh, establishment of requirements for records that wholesalers and retailers need to keep, and what the responsibilities of the Department of Revenue are, and it goes down. And then finally we get at the bottom of, of page 9, line 35 is the severability clause that I referenced earlier, which basically says that if any provisions of this act or the application thereof, to any person, thing, or circumstance is held invalid, <coughs> such invul invalidating will uh, uh, not affect the provisions or applications of this act, which can be given effect without the invalid provision or application. And to this end, the provisions of this act are declared to be severable. And then finally, you have the effective date. The fiscal note appears at the end. Um, when I introduced this bill two years ago, I gave you a great deal of information on what kinds of savings could be attained under this bill. I referenced Jeffrey Meyer, a researcher at Harvard, for his research work. He's an economist. Uh, and he has since put out a, uh, new findings as of February uh, 2010. This is the most recent information. And in this, he finds that the amount of money spent in 2008, which is the most complete record you can compile, by the state of New Hampshire was $31.7 million. And that includes law enforcement, uh, judiciary, and corrections. The tax that he anticipates us being able to receive from this act would be in the vicinity of 9.27 million. That is, of course, speculative. I don't know if we can really rely upon the figure, but Professor Myron does seem to know what he's talking about. So when you take the two together, we're talking $40 million altogether. Specifically, the judicial branch stated <coughs> that they would expect some savings because you would not be prosecuting people over the age of 21, provided they did not do anything that was in violation of any other portion of the act. So basically, you can purchase it, you can transport it at home, you can use it at home, if you use it in a public place, or even a place accessible to the public, you're in violation of the act. Any transportation or transfer, even without the remuneration to anyone under the age of 21, puts you in violation of the act. Any street sales, put you in violation of the act. Only wholesalers and retailers can trade. Any transport across state lines puts you in violation of the act. So there are still lots of prohibitions, which is why I hesitate to call it the legalization of marijuana, because there are, there are a lot of restrictions on what you can and cannot do. The finding of the judiciary, however, is uh, certain Class A felonies for people over the age of 21 would no longer be a felony or a misdemeanor and, and many of the felonies for the larger crimes would no longer be felonies so consequently the judicial branch feels that there would be a, a savings. Uh, they couldn't, again you also get this in the bill, it's indeterminate exactly how much it would be because we have what we can see which is prohibition and what we can only speculate about which is you know this, this type of act and we don't know. When you go on to uh, other findings in the fiscal note, the uh, Association of Counties uh, expects to appreciate a savings from this act. Uh, at the present time, it takes them about $35,000 to incarcerate an individual, and again, if they're over the age of 21, that would no longer be necessary. Uh, when you go over to further on in the fiscal note, uh, the Department of Revenue Administration states that there would be some increased uh, cost because they now have more external uh, duties. But the specifics of this bill says the very first allocation of the money is going to go to cover the cost of administrating this bill. So that's basically a push for them. The Department of Justice states that they don't really anticipate receiving any state, uh, any real savings from the bill because, and I'll, I'll read directly from the line, uh, they would be able to focus on marijuana-related crimes, which would be shifted to criminal activity involving other controlled drugs, which, of course, is what we want. We want them to focus on people 21 and under, and the more serious kinds of drugs, which are, are full of problems. And, of course, the Department of Corrections does expect to save money because they won't be incarcerating as many people. And that's what the bill does in a nutshell. Or maybe not so much in a nutshell. That's a long speech, but 
certain areas because I have uh, funded a, uh, a bill for the Hanel Breweries last year and that sets their fee at I believe $240 but the next level up is $1,200 so this appears to be you know, in that ballpark period. It's midway between the Nano Brewery $240 license and the $1,200 license for a full tavern. 